How yeah. are you? You know, um, I am I'm confronting death in my own way this week. My grandmother passed away on Sunday, so I'm very I'm, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it's uh, how old? How old was she? Ninety. And you were close to her. Yeah, yeah. She she raised me. Oh, well, I'm very sorry. That's terrible. Yeah, I mean, I have both of my parents great luckily but um she was just a huge part of my upbringing so it's oh yeah but it, this couldn't have come at a better time i'm so grateful to have some some time with you today because i think you're contemplating it seems like you're contemplating death as well and so i was hoping we could sure could look at that together sure whatever you want yeah i uh i sort of had this idea of you know death death within us and um death outside of us so societally and looking at how we treat the elderly in the western world and and who you think maybe gets that right culturally today or in the past and then a bit of the role of religion in a secularized world and how maybe religions have helped us to to examine death so i know we don't have much <laughs> i'm gonna try and keep it there's a lot <laughs> yeah that sounded like four hours worth but okay <laughs> so these are just the things on my mind and, and okay so we can see what let's, we can. let's dive right in i'm ready good yeah so i mean in doing a bit of research for today and i'm an, just an absolute fan of, of all of your works but oh, really, thank you yeah absolutely just i mean critical reads no question about that um, but looking specifically at what you're doing for your next book and um, <laughs> contemplating death within us and your near-death experience, you mentioned, you know, urgency and gratitude is maybe two pinnacle pieces of that and facing facing death head on. And so I was just curious, well, really, how somebody that maybe hasn't faced that could do it because I certainly feel I have moments in my life I can rely on a near-death car accident a loss where I literally had a baby dead within me where I could physically I had a baby that oh. was dead inside of my body where it's very there's this physical sensation I can draw upon but for somebody that maybe hasn't come okay. face to face with death in that way I'm, I'm curious about how how you think they can go about meditating on it and their own mortality and keeping it right in front of them daily. I know you've done some work on meditations and things. So, well, the, the difference is normally we go around and we we're all obviously aware of our mortality, our death from a very early age, but it remains an intellectual abstract concept. I don't care what people say. They, they'll say, Oh, I think about it all the time. I know it. I'm sorry. No, it's just an intellectual idea for you. And what you need to do is you need to make it a reality. I call it a visceral reality. It's here in your gut. And the way I explain that is, um, so the moment you're born, you're carrying with you your mortality. You're fated to die, right? And so you have a feeling inside of you of what life feels like, obviously. You know, it in your blood, you know, you feel your fingers, you feel your heartbeat, you feel your breathing, you know what it means to be alive. But the same thing is you have death inside of you as well. It is a feeling as well that you can connect to. Just as you are take for granted the signs of your life, you're not really paying attention to those visceral sensations of death that are actually within you every moment. So there are little ways that, that, that it comes upon you that you may not think about, but let's say the moment before you fall asleep, where you have that kind of weird sensation where you're in between two worlds, there's a word for it that escapes me right now, that moment just before you sleep where you're entering a dream state. You're in between two worlds, it's like a twilight realm. And that sense that you have of kind of momentarily losing your consciousness, because you are, is a presentiment of death itself, right? So you have moments like that. If you ever, for a moment, feel yourself stop breathing or you feel your heartbeat accelerating, you kind of know from deep within that your heart, which is the center of everything, that carries within it 
the, the signs of your death. It's very sensitive, intimate feeling that we all have. I know myself since a very early age, I always felt my heart. And I was very aware of it. And I, I had, I was born with a, a heart murmur, which is not a problem, but it's like I have an abnormality. So I was always conscious of my heartbeat and how it can disappear. So what you want to do is you want to meditate on it as a reality, as something visceral, as something physical, as something that you feel as in those moments of death, uh, uh, in those moments where you momentarily lose consciousness, etc. And you want to make that as real as you can possibly can in your day to day experience. Um, you know, you meditate on it often and you think about it, but you give it a kind of what they call embodied cognition. You're thinking about it in a bodily, physical sense, not in an abstract, intellectual way. That, to me, is sort of the key difference and is what will absolutely transform your relationship to death if you're able to do it. Yeah. Yeah, which is interesting if you haven't had the sensation before. But I think those are some really great examples of before sleep, especially. You're kind of almost holding on, but... You can be jolted awake, sort of, or that feeling like you're falling sometimes when you're asleep and you kind of get this jolt. I, I yeah. think I was reminded of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I there's actually, I don't know if you've heard of the study by Eric Byrne in 1972. He, he talked about, he asked participants what, what they think about it'll be like at the end of life. And then he categorized those individuals based off of um winners mundane or losers based off of their responses of if they thought they would be positive surrounded by people or if they kind of just thought oh, i'm not so sure and then people that thought oh what's the point and really sort of just fatalist um uh -huh. i'm curious if you've noticed any correlations there with how people think about think about what life will be like on their deathbed or as they conjure that vision of okay what what will be on your dying day have you noticed or, or what are your thoughts around the different responses there because i find people's response to that question very fascinating if they feel that they've or if they've even contemplated it at all well also i don't necessarily know how honest people are when they do talk about something like that i hate to say that but you know um i often tell people <clears throat> when i i meditate in the morning every morning i've been doing it for a long time i used to do it more often i don't do it as much now since i've had my stroke because <clears throat> i don't need to but I'd often meditate on my last day. I would try and envision my last day on earth. And I would envision it always in a particular way. It was daytime. I could see the sun pouring in. I was in a particular room. I had a very real image in my mind. And that I tried to give it, as I did that, positive consequences, you know, a, a feel, a, a positive affect, like, I, I, I'm seeing, because I'm somebody that's very sensitive to light. I can't stand dark rooms. I get very claustrophobic. I need lots of light around me. I live in California where fortunately the light is always pretty much there. And so light is like, to me, is like life, right? And in fact, ancient concepts of death were always in an underworld where it's just perpetual darkness after you die, <clears throat> you know? And so in ancient for ancient Greeks, just seeing the light was a sign of life and made you grateful to be alive. So I tried to give it positive affect, like there's light shining in. Sometimes there would be people around me, but I didn't mind the idea of actually even being alone because I've been alone. My we're all alone essentially when we're born. We go through life essentially alone. I mean, there are I, that's I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit because we have very intense relationships, but. I myself personally have spent a lot of time alone. I don't have negative things like that. So I try and surround it, not like trying to be Pollyannish or sentimental or anything because you can't be, but I try and give it a sense of it's part of life. It's a positive moment. It's a passage from one state to another. And I try and give it this kind of, I hate to say almost sort of a spiritual sense for me where, and so you know, people who imagine it in a different way, who imagine it like ugly and dark and horrifying, they don't want to confront it. Yeah, that, that's the type of person that's very avoidant. And I try and say, if you're avoidant of your own death, you're not really living. 
And what I mean by that is underneath all of our emotions, all of our day-to-day -day thinking is anxiety. We all have this kind of pool of anxiety that we carry with us in every encounter, in every moment in life. It's always popping up. The source of that anxiety is our mortality, our consciousness of death. It's like underneath it all, like the like underneath the soil, and these kind of plants sprout up, which are anxiety, but underneath it is our fear of death. And so if you're not confronting it, you're just going to be riddled with these anxieties. They're going to eat away at you. And you're not even aware of it. You don't realize in your day-to-day -day life that these anxieties, you're not confronting them. You're not confronting the source of them. And you're like a prisoner of them. So confronting your death and kind of thinking about it and giving it this, if you can, placing it in a context that to you personally is, is warm or nice is a very positive way to daily confront it. It may not be light shining through it, maybe at night with the stars and the moon up in the sky. It might be lying outside, you know, it might be surrounded by your family, your friends, your pets, whatever. I don't care, but try and give it that kind of positive image if possible. Yeah, and you mentioned um, just a little bit about the Greeks, but then I, I get very curious, maybe we, we head to death outside of us where um, I'm very curious if you think that there's a society today or in the past that got the the conception or the, the concept of death and thinking about death correct, because I think, as you've mentioned, we repress it in society today, which has big implications. Um, so who do you think got this right in terms of thinking about death and perhaps even in if memorializing death or, or celebrating death? Well, I'd say indigenous cultures are generally a lot better than us. And that's going back quite a bit far in, in time um, where there were all kinds of rites and a sense. <clears throat> so in a lot of indigenous cultures, which I write about in my new book, have um, various rites of passage. That's a very important part. It's kind of a universal part of our ancestry. And so becoming an adolescent and going into adulthood was a rite of passage, similar to passing from life into death. You're, you're saying goodbye to your youth, and now you're entering the adult world. Or if you got married, you were saying goodbye to your single life, you've died, and now you're reborn as a married person, part of a union. So there were all these, these kind of rites that kind of grounded you in a sense of continual transitions. And that to me is very healthy. And the idea of making it a ritual of something that is a group encounter that the group involved in is something we've completely lost. The problem for us, and it's a very depressing problem, I have to say, is that death doesn't have any presence in our lives. And that was the difference between our culture and people in the past. Even just going back a couple hundred years, um, you were constantly seeing people dying around you. People died in their homes mostly. You saw people die dead in the streets when you hadn't when you ate an animal, a chicken or whatever, you had literally saw it being killed in front of your eyes. You saw it all the time, maybe not every day, but it had a, a physical presence in your life, right? Now, because we're so terrified, the thought of it so agitates us that we have to hide it away in hospitals, in rooms where nobody's allowed in. It's like it's like something we don't want to confront. It's like our little dirty little secrets in our closets there in these hospitals. So like the only time we ever see death is in our entertainment, in our movies, in our video games. And it's given this kind of cartoonish aspect as if it's not real, as if people are being shot by guns. And then we can almost laugh it out. We're so desensitized to the actual reality. You know, each person dies. And each person's death is a story, is a tragedy, is a drama. It's not like 30 people die, haha, <laughs> just a bunch of numbers being shot down or, or capsized in a boat and die. Each person has their own precious life, just like you have it. We've lost such a sense of that because we never see it. And because we don't see it, it has no reality to it. So almost any culture in the past, even mainstream religions like Christianity and Judaism and Islam, they give you a sense, you're confronted with your mortality in a very real way. 
and you know maybe thoughts of the afterlife we can't really entertain anymore because we're so scientific and sophisticated but the idea of creating a sense that there's something larger than you that that your life is transcendent that there's something bigger than just your little life and that you're a part of it which religions grounded you and i think is something we we very much miss so almost any culture in the past would handle it better than we do. But in particular, I would mention indigenous cultures. Wow, yeah, so many so many pieces there. I definitely feel that there is this dirty secret component and that it's removed certainly in my delivery. The doctor kind of wanted to swoop away this, this dead baby and you don't wanna see that. And I thought, I don't wanna see this. It's it came from within my body. Of course, I want to see it and hold it and be with it. I, how? So, I, yes, I completely agree with you there. It was this removal or in secret and separation that I that I absolutely didn't want um, in my experience. So that piece resonates. Um, the rituals piece resonates. I wonder what you think about religion then given that, okay, indigenous cultures and then religion kind of comes in and has its own way. Um, but we are in such a secularized world where we do think that we're so much smarter and that faith could just, is this ridiculous notion when, I mean, I like the idea of believing that things are faded. I mean, this interview, I've waited for a year to speak with you and my grandmother passes away on Sunday and here we are on Wednesday having this conversation and it, could not have come at a more important time for me personally, selfishly in my life. So, yeah. you know, I could say, yeah, chance, or I could say, no, this is exactly when this needed to happen for me. So I just wonder what you think, because yeah, it's religion is kind of in question. I'm living in Austin at the moment. And there, I think oh. in the Bible belt, you still get, you still have that strong Christian faith that, that holds true in, with a lot of people, but I'm wondering what you think our path forward is here. I know one thing you're saying is this contemplation within us and viscerally feeling it. Another is how do, how do we get in front of death then and see it? Because people aren't, you know, most people are not on farms with chickens or in old age homes confronted with, you know, seeing people passing away or in a hospital setting. So how can we put ourselves in front of it outside of ourselves? So we have this technique of meditation within ourselves to connect viscerally. What do you think? Where can we, or how do we get close to this in our lives uh, outside of ourselves? Well, um, it a lot of it is, you know, we have powers of imagination that we very rarely even touch upon. Uh, we have powers of empathy, which is probably to me the greatest, what separates us as, as a species and has made us powerful is our ability to place ourselves in the shoes of other people and imagine what they're thinking and imagining what they're feeling. So I remember one day I was in New York. This was, I don't know how many years ago. I was walking down the street and there was like tons of people as they are in Manhattan, just walking on the streets, going every which way. And I suddenly had this thought, like all of these people in 80 years are going to be gone. Every single last one of them will be dead in that period. Each of them carries their mortality in them. And it made me look at them in a different light. Whereas normally, as someone who is a bit of an introvert, I was like, God, get me away from crowds. And it's so impersonal, et cetera. It made me see it in a very human way. Okay, so one thing is you have your own mortality and you have to think about it. But you can think about it in terms of other people every single day of your life. You can think about the people that you love. They're going to die. And you can vis visualize it and think about it. And it changes how you look at them. You know, all the petty things that you kind of hate about them, how they irritate the hell out of you, kind of don't mean so much if you're aware that they may very well die before you kind of thing. So, um, and then it kind of connects you in a larger way with something that's much larger than yourself. The problem that we face today and, and the reason why, uh, what we miss, I think, in religion is a sense of scale. So uh, I'm writing, I wrote about this in my new book. If you look at the world, if you look at the universe and you contemplate it, 
we are incredibly small. We are inc infinitesimally small, infinitesimally unimportant, you know, in comparison to the cosmos, in comparison to space, in comparison to just how many organic, how many living things there are on planet Earth. We are so small. We are so unimportant. And yet we walk around and we've completely inverted the equation. And we think that we, my, I, me, I'm so important. I'm the most important thing in the world, right? Everything else is kind of trivial. That inversion is, is very painful because I think we all need to have a sense of something much larger than who we are. And confronting your death is kind of a way to, to do that, you know, because I, I often like to do, I, I play little thought experiments. Like I often think of, how many humans have already died on planet earth? You know, I, I don't know the number, the billions of number and what that would be, but you know, I'm going to be a part of that at some point. And it's a kind of a strange, interesting thought about um, what's in context, how small your life is, but how you're connected to all these other stories. And then how many other creatures on planet earth have died the, the ground beneath you, the earth that you walk on, is built on the, the bones, the, the, the disintegrating, the decaying bodies of other creatures, literally. Um, and so these are ways, ways of thinking that kind of bring death into your everyday life in a way that's not morbid, but is kind of poetic. It kind of makes you think about the world, the universe, the cosmos, in a different way that I think kind of elevates it and, and takes it out of that kind of depressing, morbid air that we usually think about it. Yeah, I, I love that relating it to, I can even, as you were talking, I could just, you know, even buildings and who designed them and everywhere. Yeah. it's just, it's it's literally everywhere, remnants of of others and how they've influenced and I mean, of course, we yeah. have statues and things that commemorate important people, but there are just, there's, you know, my grandmother's plants that still come up in the garden. So, you know, it's, it's um, in big and little ways, I think. Sometimes a lot of people these days, unfortunately, have the experience with their pets, hmm. you know, because animals, dogs and cats don't live that long, 10, 12, 15 years. And we get very close to them. I got, I'm personally an animal lover and I've had cats, although I love dogs as well. And, you know, when they die, it's just the horrible. I mean, I had my father die, which is obviously worse, but I get so close to my cats and that moment where they die. And if you hold them in those last moments, you know, I think a lot of people in this world today are actually going through that experience more than they do with people, unfortunately. But that's another way that I think a lot of people in the world kind of, because, you know, as much as, as our culture kind of separates us from nature, which is a real problem, we, we remain animals, we remain, we still have blood inside of us, we remain part of nature, we can't escape it. And so there's a part of each and every person that kind of yearns for those experiences. You may not be consciously aware of it but it's there underneath the soil. It's kind of brewing in you sort of thing. Definitely. And I, I see it in my dog all, all the time where I just, oh. you're not going to, you know, I, I really soak it up with him because he's just, he's always thrilled to see me, which is, you know, not many yeah. humans. I can't say the same <laughs> thing about. I know, I know. So he, I, yeah, I look at him and I just think you're, I mean, He's, I mean, my husband is my best friend, but he's certainly, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, you can say you can say your dog is. I wouldn't hold that against you, but yeah. <laughs> you know, he's just so. I think that's this unconditional love that they share. That, yeah, that exactly. It's uh, yeah. I certainly look at him and just think I better soak this up because it's and, not going to last. So. And it's interesting because animals have a visceral relationship to death that we've lost. They mm -hmm. feel it. They know it. They can sense it when someone around them is dying. I remember when I was seven years old, I had a dog named Buddy that I was very close to. And I was lying on the floor in our house and Buddy was acting kind of strange. And he was, we were looking at each other and 
And I just had this sense that he was trying to tell me that he was dying. And then he did end up dying like a day or two later. But they know it and they feel it and they're communicating it to you. And we probably have that power as well, but we've lost it. 100% because my grandfather, so the husband of my grandmother that just passed away, he absolutely knew it and almost... I don't know that he decided it, but somehow he sensed it. And he told my father and he said, I'm ready. He just, he had this understanding, a uh, res resolve about him. And, and that weekend, he just was well, ready. They've been, they've been together for many years, I imagine. 61 years. Whoa, whoa. Well, you get, when you're <laughs> 61 years, that other person's like in your blood, you know, there's like a, so much a part of you that, that you are able to intuit things like that. That's a great story. Yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, he, he knew when he, my grandfather's passed. So he knew when he was going to die very clearly within himself. And I think she sensed it. And the fact that he could verbalize it to my dad and just, it was, it was this very interesting. And I think to your point, intuitive or even visceral feeling that they could communicate. So he, he had a sense of it, which I thought was just wild that he could yeah. speak to that. Um, before it happened so definitely I think some people could I wonder oh and I know time I have to be <laughs> mindful of time um, but I, I wonder about grief you know I think the fear maybe part of it comes from this feeling that it will consume us you know I certainly there's this wave of emotion if I think about my grandmother especially right now and it feel you know it, it can feel all consuming and I, so I think that's where part of the fear comes is this is just going to swallow me whole sort of thing and so I, I wonder about your thoughts there, just about grief or, you know, because, okay, I look at it, I can, I'll be right in front, I'll be looking at death tomorrow very, very <laughs> clearly in the eye. Um, and so, you know, what do we do with, do with that fear, fear of looking it in the eye, fear of, the fear of maybe not being able to handle it, because it's it's big it feels it feels consuming and almost like it could knock you over and that's terrifying so how do we well, build courage or how do we how do we wrestle with that well i think the uh, confronting it and making it more part of your everyday life and your reality intellectually and viscerally and particularly emotionally will help in that sense in that it's it's because um you know, it's such it's it's so it's so distant from our lives that when it does hit it hit us, it's almost unbearable because we're not prepared for it. We haven't thought about it, and that is one thing that re mainstream religions used to do very well, which was kind of prepare you for the thought and bring it to your mind. So, you know, preparing for it a little bit and thinking about it. But the other thing is, you know, when I read about other ancient cultures or older cultures. And they're describing their death rites. <clears throat> People the, in the clan or the group or the family, they're like crying like crazy. They're tearing their hair out. They're getting violent. They're, there's like an anger. It's a weird thing, but the death of someone close to you churns up a weird sort of anger. I don't know if that happened to you, but I know when my father passed away, and I don't even know where it comes from. I think some of it comes from kind of you look at all the other people there who who take life for granted. And they, they're almost like on a different planet from you who know that it's not like that. And they kind of piss you off that they're so oblivious, right? And they're living in their little bubble. But there's also some other weird emotions that are churned up that I can't even really necessarily explain. So the idea of intense grief, of crying, of pulling your hair out, has always seemed to me kind of cathartic and positive. And I think... You know, there's a, a famous psychologist um, and, and philosopher um, named Wilhelm Reich. He was a, originally a, a student of Freud. He called it, uh, what's wrong with humans is we have what's called character armor. And he, he was a, he physically located it here in the chest area where we carry this armor and it makes us so that we can't feel any kind of deep emotions. It kind of keeps us enclosed in this. So if we don't feel deep emotions, then we don't, have to have to deal with intense pain and so i think a moment of confrontation with that where you're forced to grieve and it's very powerful and it's unpleasant it's horrible but i think it's a positive thing because we live 
with this kind of armor, this chain mail inside of us. And you want to be able to let it go. And, you know, if you want to be angry and you want to be angry that, 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 this, that someone love, that you love is gone and you're angry that ever people are so stupid out in the world, I think it's a positive thing to kind of let it go and, 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 and let it happen in your life because maybe then they'll help loosen up some other emotions that are blocked inside of you. Yeah, I love that for sure. And I think that's maybe even part of the armor is to go to anger and kind of want to unload on, you know, the nursing home staff and who, who yeah. did what and how did they treat her and just, I can go on and on for sure on that bit. But yeah, I think it starts. And then if you get that out, that bit out, then there's this deep um, surrendering piece that I, for me, what I went toward was, was prayer and I was raised Catholic and my grandmother actually taught me how to pray and the, and the rosary and she taught me that and so um you know I'd never I never thought of it again I mean I'm a teenager what am I thinking what do I care about the rosary I'm too cool for the rosary and right, sure, right. But what, I had my confirmation and then why should I bother with that I don't need that um, but definitely the the kind of death and and labor process with the, with this infant loss that I that happened last year I would say oh. I just felt I, that's where I turned and I didn't feel like there was anything else that could explain you're talking about you know the the scale and just it, it, nothing else could come close to explaining why things like that happen or give me the peace that prayer and that contemplation and and even I just I I started reading the Bible front to back thinking, okay, I've got to, I just started thinking, where should I go and search for something? What, what, who has answers for me? Um, and so I, yeah, I really worry about this whole secularization of, of society because I think when, when the going gets tough, where do you want to turn for, for that foundation or that bedrock or some bigger meaning, or, you know, I'll take fate, all day long uh because how else do we grapple with the, the meaning of events like that tragic events like that how else can we possibly wrap our minds around it science or you know i have the scientific information i have the what happened to the baby and why did the baby die and what scientifically happened that's shallow completely shallow in comparison like it just means i don't care it doesn't do anything for me to have the the medical report zero yeah. Well, that's in some ways um, where I think women um, experience it on a different level than men do, which is very interesting in that, you know, first of all, you feel another life inside of you. You feel another heartbeat inside of you. Um, so that's all totally different sense than what I'm, you know, I'm saying, make it visceral and real. But for a woman, it's much more real than what you experienced is the, you know, the ultimate kind of grief there. I mean, I can, I can imagine a lot of things, but I can't really go that far because I've never been anything like that. I mean, I almost personally almost died. And then I carry that inside of me almost like a dead baby because I can kind of feel, you know, the feeling that I had then. Um, but it's still not the same thing. So for the women out there, they have an advantage in the sense that they are women tend to be a little bit closer to those kind of visceral bodily feelings of life and death than I think men are. I mean, I'm generalizing, but that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. And I, I just wonder nothing. Religion is where I went. And so I wonder if people, you know, a lot of people don't want to go to religion because of what churches have done or what religious institutions have done. They, yeah. they, you know, so they, they, throw everything out right the wisdom of those texts yeah. they throw it out with the challenges or the problems of the institution and so i just any any last i know we've got to go any last thoughts there? <laughs> on, a, a, any last bits there just on you know either drawing upon religion or your studies there or what you've noticed the utility is or how we might pull that in is it mainly this contemplation practice that you you have on a daily basis? Well, no, I mean, I think religion can play a very important part. And, um, you know, I, I personally, I don't like to talk about it too much, but I've been practicing um, Zen meditation and Buddhism, um, which is a different kind of religion because 
it's a religion without a God, but it has very powerful elements of faith. And I don't think I'd be alive right now if it weren't for that. You know, it has grounded me in something very, very important. And it's given meaning to so many things that I didn't have it before. And so I think a sense of a ritual, rituals are very important. And I think people miss them. A sense of belonging to a community of, of a faith that has deep roots because everything in our world is so superficial. You know, we're only interested in what happened last year in what songs or people or influencers were hot six months ago. But to take a religion in the case, in the case of Catholicism that's thousands of years old or you know, a religion like Buddhism, which is 2,500 years old, there are religions that are even much older than that. And to be kind of grounded in that and a feeling, it gives you a sense of being grounded in something much larger than yourself. It's a very powerful sensation. And then, you know, the ideas of, of prayer, of meditation that most religions have. These are practices that we've lost. And you don't have to, if you don't want to believe in something like that. I don't, you know, as I said, in Buddhism, there is no real sense of a transcendent God. The idea is that it's inside of each, every human being. So maybe you don't interested in that particular aspect. And that's what turns you off in religion because you're so infused with scientific thinking. But the other ideas of, of being aware of how small you are, of bringing some sense of rituals to your life and to contemplating a death the way religions do and to, some, and to having some kind of sense of faith that there's something, you know, um, I don't know if you were talking, I didn't, I might have misheard you. I didn't know if you were saying faith or fate at one point. But, um, you know, uh, for me, for instance, when I had my stroke, uh, that's what almost killed me. I was driving a car here in Los Angeles and my wife who was in, next to me, she saw something very strange happening to my face and she essentially saved my life. I wouldn't be talking here today with you if she weren't there. I would have either died or I would have had severe brain damage. I'd be a vegetable. So, and then if I thought about it, 99% of the time or 90% of the time, I'm alone. I'm on my bicycle, I'm swimming, I'm in another room, I'm somewhere else, I'm traveling. If it had happened in any of those moments, I would be dead. So there was a sense of like it, fate, it was meant to happen. There was something, there was a reason for it, right? What is that? I'm not saying that it's necessarily from God or whatever. I don't really know. But there was something larger than just the day-to-day -day events of my life and cause and effect. There was something else stranger going on. I don't know what it is, but I think it's important to think about these things. And I think we've all had experiences like that where we felt a sense of fate, like something is happening. I don't know why, but it's kind of eerie that it, maybe it was meant to happen. These are moments in your life that kind of connect you to something outside or beyond. You know, science has become our new religion in effect. It's become something that nobody can doubt. The moment you sort of say, well, there are limits to how much science I want in my life. You're like, oh my God, you're like a heretic. We're gonna burn you at a stake. How can you say something like that? It is our new religion. And I love science and it's an important part of my work, but there are limits to it. And there are limits to how much we should allow into our life. There is something large that we need to contemplate. Well, hey, I think that's, I, I could go for another 24 hours, but I think that that's, a, that's the best <laughs> perhaps place to start is there certain, or end. Oh, there are certainly limits to where that can go. And I think what you mentioned is perfect that we have to contemplate what goes outside of that limit. One interview I listened to, you're mentioning you know, the circle of what's okay or not okay, and then what's outside of it. And I think that's exactly, exactly it, is we have to look outside of it. There's a circle we're okay with, with grief, with death, with science, with everything. And you're saying, hey, there's so much beyond that circle. And yeah, absolutely. And so we need to open our eyes and look at it, I, which you have yeah. said beyond this, this conversation. So I just. Yeah. That's the subject of my new book, but yeah. Which I think even your other works bring bring that to light as well. So I just want to thank you so much for today oh, thank you, and and what you do because you're shining light on things that 
absolutely cannot stay in the darkness. So okay. very grateful for you and your work. Oh, well, thank you, Colleen. I really enjoyed it. So, uh, you know, I normally I would go on longer, but I, I actually, I forgot about the interview, my, my bad. And then I have my physical therapist who came here. So, um, but if you want somewhere down the road, like a year or whenever we can have, we can redo this again and we can do it for a longer time. I would love that. I'm sure I'll, you'll have more to, is the book, do you have a, a date when the book is ish? No? It's, well, uh, give me another two years. Uh, listen, I, I wrote a book and it was the most painstaking experience of my oh. whole life. And my publisher said, you need at least four to make a mark in the author scene. And I said, I just, it took me years to write one. I, I, I have yeah. absolute respect for your process. Oh. There's okay. no, okay. there's no rushing that. So, but yes, I would love that. I would love to to follow up on this, and I'm sure there will be more in a year's time. So, yeah, writing a book is like giving birth to a child. Absolutely. Although I don't know exactly what that's like, so I'm kind yeah. of. <laughs> well, different physical, different yeah. kind of physical pain, but uh, yeah, absolutely to get your thoughts clear yeah. and compelling on a page, and you obviously have mastery over that but uh, that was that was confronting for me for sure so so yes take <laughs> take the time you need I think it's a work of art your other work your other works definitely are just masterpieces in, in okay. sense so yeah if you need two years well thank you do what you gotta do okay, I'm gonna tell my publisher that you gave me a, a approval to take two years so but thank you <laughs> I think everybody will will wait Okay. For, for you yeah for sure. okay all right it's a struggle but i'm getting there give me give me some time be patient that's all i ask yeah it's gonna, they it's gonna be an interesting weird book but just give me a little bit of time those are the best those are the best ones you're not writing a, a you know you're exploring something that is yeah literally out of this world and people you know scientists are or religious experts alike struggle wrestle to define this yeah so you're tackling i think some of the most important topics of of the current time well thank you thank you so yeah. please um contact stanley <clears throat> if he's still here with me in a year you know who knows where people go but please contact him um and, and we'll do it again and we'll make it longer Good. Yeah. I really appreciate that. And thank you. It's, it's, I've been looking forward to this for a year and I'll look oh, forward to the next. Well, I, I very much enjoyed connecting with you on this. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I hope you have a great rest of the day. I'm off to uh, look death in the eye myself and um, oh. we'll, we'll see you next time. And I hope you take good care of, of your physical health and every, everyone else in your life. Until well, same to you. And I'm very sorry to hear about your loss you know I've, I've been through and I know how terrible it could be I'm very sorry about that yeah I think it but to your to all of your points today it's it's her life absolutely reminds me of what it means to love fully she was just so yeah. unconditionally loving toward me as her granddaughter oh, and so her memory is in no question a reminder to me to like oh. let go of all the bs that uh <laughs> you know well, can go on and that i get consumed by and just really focus on and she lives inside of you she's not really dead she's still part of you so she lives on her spirit is inside of you and that's a kind of a strange immortality in itself yeah yeah not a question that that's absolutely the case i i believe that wholeheartedly so okay yeah thank you thank you Robert. thank you Kalina. well i really enjoyed it and um we'll do it again <laughs>